In this episode, I'm joined with, and in and, and full disclaimer here, full transparency, Denise and I are friends. We've been friends for some time. We met because we were both foreigners living in Bosnia and Herzegovina, in particular Banja Luka. And Denise even tried to convert me to drinking mate, which I think she has in, she must, yes, yes, you see, she has one in her hand at the moment. So in this particular episode, we want to talk about um, or introduce you to what it's like to be an immigrant in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Now, many years ago, I really didn't think that I would become an immigrant in another country. All I'd ever known was that in the United Kingdom, there were problems with so-called immigrants. I couldn't really get my head around that. And then, as I say, all these years later, uh, I end up being one in somebody else's country. So my whole view of the world has changed. So we've got the disclaimer out of the way. We will be talking about previous videos that we've done together, previous podcasts, and a lot of other stuff. Links to that will be in the show notes below. So for those that don't know, my guest today is Denise. She is from South America, from a very large country called Argentina. Very briefly, Denise, the only person that can describe you to the best is you. So who are you? Who am I? Hello. Hi, Dave. Hello, everyone. My name is Denise. I'm from Argentina. I'm a former cabin crew. I worked for an airline in the Middle East for almost 10 years. Fell in love with a Balkan man and I chose Bosnia and Herzegovina as my home and the place to raise our family today. So that's who I am. You have a very strong presence on Instagram and I woke up this morning and although I try not to doom scroll anymore, I have my favorites and you were there talking about Slava. We'll talk about what Slava is in a minute, but you have a very punchy way of telling your stories to quite a unique audience because you do it both in English and in Spanish, don't you? I do. I feel like I wanted to start in Spanish because it's my native language and initially I wanted to start sharing more information about this part of the world in Spanish because there's a lack of it online. But then I realized that people who speak English were also wanting to understand what I was saying. And I thought, you know what, let me just go bilingual to the best I can because it is a lot of work. And although our house is trilingual, <laughs> it's very hard to switch languages all the time. So I'm just trying to share a bit of all the languages and the main goal is just to share as much as possible about life in the Balkans in Bosnia. I find language here. I speak German and I don't have a problem with that at all, but with the languages of, we'll be very politically correct now, right? The languages of Bosnia and Herzegovina for me are exceedingly difficult. I can get by. So a two part question. One, how difficult was it the other day when you were on local television being interviewed to use, let's say, Serbian in this case? I know it most probably was difficult. I'd like to find out what you felt like when you were in that studio on, on television not so long ago and how easy or not so easy has it been for you to communicate not only with friends and neighbors, but more importantly, with, with the family of your husband. Okay, so to begin with the, the interview at the studio, I really didn't know it was going to be live. I thought it was going to be a pre-recorded interview. So that did bring me... You know, it did catch me by surprise, but I think it happens every time I go out in the street and I don't know the situation I'm going to encounter and it just, the, the language just goes off in my head. I do not speak it at all properly, not perfectly, but I do think people can understand me. And as a Spanish speaker, I think it's way easier than it is for other speakers because... You say it, how do they say it? That you say it as, you read it as it's written? What is the saying? Oh, for phonetically. Serbian? It's not very, I don't have to think about, I don't know, pronunciation or the way it's written is the way it comes out. And there are a lot of Spanish words that are, have similarity to the language. I do my own connection in my head. Or there are some words that, for example, mean something in Spanish, but they mean something else in Serbian. So I do this connection and... 
when I'm on the spot and I have to speak it, then that just triggers in my head. When it comes to my family, to my husband's family, they know they are, they have to be very patient with me. And I think they already know the amount of words that I know. So they know what I'm going to say, or they know the answer I will give them, but it's not, I, I don't think there is a barrier anymore when it comes to communication. And there are different tools. For example, Viber is commonly used here the instead of WhatsApp. So Viber has the translator already incorporated in the app. So it's very easy to text with them and I can translate what they're saying and vice versa. So I think the language barrier, I've overcome it, but I do learn daily. Yeah, so do, so do I. I've had to go to the hospital recently and I've got some more visits and that is the one place that I need Tamara with me. And that is so uh, complicated. The other, Definitely. I don't know, was it over a week ago now that I was checking uh, on YouTube and I like to, to keep up to date with what you're doing. I know what you're doing normally, but it is nice. And then there was this, yeah, I'm going to give you credit where credit was due, this amazing video and you called it five reasons why we chose Bosnia to live in. And the five reasons were safety, geography, quality of life, nature, and society in general. And when I went through that, I thought, this is a better advertisement, if you like, or promotion for the country than all these wonderful videos of waterfalls and history and everything else. But I was quite taken by the fact that your first point that you wanted to make to people was about safety. Now, does that mean that Argentina is a less safe place than where you and I now live? Uh, I would say, of course, Argentina is in South America and it's commonly known for not being very safe as other countries in South America. But also I took responsibility in choosing that number one because I traveled so much. I've been to almost 80 countries, so I feel like I can say that. There's a lot of content online of people who just throw statements, but based on how much of their knowledge. So I am very conscious of the content I share online. And if I say something, it's because I feel like I have the experience to say it. I've traveled to all continents, to many countries. And of course, Argentina is not safe for other reasons, but the safety that is felt here, not only out in the street, I don't know if, even if I want to travel by myself, I took the bus as a woman by myself from Banja to Sarajevo. This is like one of the most common questions I get. Is it safe to travel by myself if I'm a woman? And I live here, I can see it. And for me, it's such a surprise to get such question, but it's a very commonly asked question. I don't think it's emphasized enough how safe it is to go out in the street really late at night as a woman, to be able to leave your phone on a coffee table if you're out having a coffee. Besides Argentina, let's talk about Western Europe. Like, for example, I don't know, Spain, Barcelona, you can easily get robbed there. Like, it's getting more common to get robbed. And it doesn't happen here, but I don't think people know that. Yeah, and I don't think I think it's a very important them. point. And I don't think that people from here either appreciate how safe an environment they, they live in. Your second point was geography. I'd like you to go into that because over the cold weather months, and we'll talk about a little later, over the cold weather months, you went away for a little bit of time. So the geography is very important to you, I think. Definitely. After working for the airline and traveling so much, when the idea to come here popped up, we thought it's fantastic the where it's located, how well connected it is, not only with airports, but driving wise, it's really great. We went to Spain. We are going every year now, which is way closer than Argentina, but I do get my, my doses of Spanish speaking, my food. I have a lot of friends there, so it's more convenient to travel from Bosnia than it is from Argentina and from many other points, I would say. We have a beautiful Adriatic Sea 
four hours away. We have huge cities a few hours away. I, I think it could sound very remote, but it's really not. What's your favorite destination when you go away for, a, let's say, a mini break? Do you mean in the area? Yeah, yeah. Okay, this will sound very biased, but I love going to our village, to my husband's village, the Selo, which is at the very top of a high mountain, and it's the freshest air I ever breathe. It's beautiful disconnection. You only hear the cows. This will be on my top. Of course, I cannot be there for a whole week, <laughs> only two days, but definitely would have to be anywhere on the Adriatic coastline. I would say any, anywhere outside of Split, maybe Amish, around that area. Quality of life. My quality of life here is, I think, far better than what I could have had uh, in the UK or would it uh, be able to experience in the UK at the moment if for no other reason the limited amount of income I have goes a lot further. How is it for you? Because you love your culture so much, like you have your mate with you at the moment, which can you get hold of mate here in, in Bosnia? That's another question for you. What is quality of life like for you now? And especially I'll tell people that, yeah, when you were air crew, cabin crew, you were based in one of the most sumptuous places in the world called Dubai. So having that Argentinian background, that feel of 10 years in a very glamorous uh, Arabic location and now coming here. Quality of life. How do you balance it? Cool. What's your priorities? Yeah. That's, uh, that was a point I was going to make. Again, bearing in mind that I spent almost a decade in a very comfortable city, in a very comfortable position. I could order whatever I wanted at three in the morning and I would get it on my doorsteps. But I think that also would create some negative feelings. I, I, I don't know. I think being too comfortable is just any extreme is bad. So when it comes to quality of life, I do have to say it's a very uh, subjective topic. So I would say my life has quality now because of my conditions, because I'm an expat and I'm a mother. And so, so for example, Dubai, yeah, very comfortable city, but you've got the traffic You've got, it's a huge melting pod, <laughs> over melting. <laughs> so there could be a lot of clashes over there culturally, a lot of cultural shock. I do have it here, but I think it's, I would say more subtle. You would think that Dubai is more cosmopolitan, but the, the mixes are really, I want to say drastic. Yeah. The working environment, of course, my, my work and the reason I lived there was quite stressful when it came to timings, to demand. So that changed completely when we moved here. My, my stress levels decreased so much. And there is really what's called slow living here. You can take your life at the pace you want. Quality of life is being able to walk everywhere, whereas in Dubai or in any other cities, you would have to take public transportation, get in your car, go through traffic and here I can walk everywhere. I can take my bike everywhere. Yeah, being surrounded by the nature for me is something very important, which I didn't have in Dubai. Okay, delivery wise, these services now, they're like the ones that I use, like supermarket or I don't know, all the DM, all the toiletries I need for my daughter. I can get stuff delivered here, which is very convenient. I don't think a lot of people are aware of this. I would have to say that since I don't speak the language completely, maybe my husband deals with most of the bureaucratic stuff. And I guess that could be the most stressful thing in our lives right now. Whenever I have to do a visa or something, I don't deal with that. So that really improves my quality of life. But yeah, overall, I think the being able to do slow living, I think that's really something that gives me quality of life. When we first met, we both were laughing with each other about food, <clears throat> the death by meat culture, which at that time, if I remember correctly, you were quite shocked with because you liked your large doses of vegetables, etc. This morning, as I said, when I saw the video, the Instagram story or reel, 
it was mentioning about slava, which is I'll let people watch the video without taking your thunder away. But the celebration of slava is, without a doubt, whichever way you try to square it, it's full of meat. So that brings me on to food. How have you coped now, <laughs> having been here for some time, uh, with the food? And for somebody that's either watching and or listening to this and is thinking of coming here, how would you, if you were talking to somebody now in a coffee bar who says, yeah, I really like to go there, but I'm a little bit concerned about the food. What, how, would you, how would you come across with that? I think when we met, we were still staying at my in-laws. So I wasn't doing a lot of the cooking and it was really just the food being served to me. And of course, they have their way of eating, which is primarily meat. And if you're lucky, some vegetables. But now that we live on our own and I'm cooking, it's quite different. So I would only eat the traditional dishes when there is some gathering or a special event. But... I think here at home, we do keep our menu and our diet as we would before. I do love the access to fresh products that we have. Everything. I don't think a lot of it goes under process. Maybe things from the supermarket, but you have your little vegetable shops around the area and that's very fresh. Um, Anyone who is wondering about the food here and how they're going to cope with it, I do find some sort of diversity Mainly it is meat, but I really like that they have this uh, postnal options sometimes when people have to do fasting before a, I want to say a religious date. And sometimes they do have almost vegan options and they do a lot of clean eating. If you go to a restaurant, you will find, yeah, a lot of meat loaded dishes, but I do think there are options to choose from. What's your favorite local dish and what is the, your favorite Spanish orientated dish in your life at the moment? Oh my God, Dave, I remember you asked me this the first time we talked and I told you Sarama and you were like, what? (laughs) And now I'm like, I cannot see Sarama anymore. (laughs) Because I hadn't gone through the Sarma season yet. <laughs> There's Sarma everywhere. So definitely not Sarma. Anything pechenia, anything that is like roasted, whether it's lamb or pig. I'm from Argentina. I am a meat lover. So I am in the right place here. <laughs> but there, there are quite a few things that I like. But I would have to say anything pechenia is the best for me. What's the favorite meal to cook at home? Oh my gosh, here I love to make milanesas. They are like Argentinian style schnitzels with uh, mashed potatoes. I love this dish. I could eat it every day. So I thought that would be my favorite one, yeah. Have you introduced your uh, in-laws to your Spanish cooking? Oh yeah, yeah, they like it. They like, they really like when I cook and they try different things because they do have this set menu and it kind of rotates. So whenever they try something from outside, they love it. For example, but this is not about my food. One time we were having breakfast and they had kaimak, which is this delicious cheese here and a really nice domacha jam, really nice homemade jam. So I took the ushtipsi and I mixed the kaimak with the jam and everyone just stared at me because you either eat it with jam or with kaimak. And I was like, you guys, where is this written? You have to try this combo. And they loved it. So whenever they try things, I suggest different things. They give it a go and, and they like it. Funny you should say that because in the West of England, we have people in the county of Cornwall and the and in Devon, West Country people, we call them. And they're famous for having scones, which I think the Americans would call biscuits. But nevertheless, they have scones and they put clotted cream and jam on top. And when you look at the dictionary, it says that in Serbian in particular, the clotted cream is kaimak, but it's salty, right? Mm -hmm. It's salty. And that just doesn't jive with what I was brought up with. 
And very, it's take honestly, it's taken 20 years for us to find a place in Banja Luka where you can buy sweet Kaimak or nearly sweet Kaimak. Ah. And so now we have made, Tamara makes English style scones. We now put this Kaimak on top and then put jam on top of that and then put the topping on and put it on the table. I'm telling you, her family think it's crack cocaine. They just want so much of it, they can't get enough. So there are these, if you look, like you said, if you look around, you can do that. But I can imagine, I, I was, I tried to keep a straight face, but bush dipsy, which yeah. is like fried bread balls, really, right? With clotted cream and jam would phase some people out. We're, we're not blessed with a lot of time today, which I think is good because it leads me on to the next question. I think that when you really get to know a culture and you get to know a new destination or a, a new phase of your life that you know will be long-term mm. is when a new member of the family joins you. Little Vera now, who's toddling about and is the absolute, to see her on videos now, an absolute delight. But you gave birth to Vera here a huge amount of miles, kilometers or whatever, away from your traditionally safe zone, comfort zone. One, what was it like, without going into TMI, but what was it like going through the whole process of pregnancy and to where Vera is now, who I think oh, straight after recording this, you're going to collect her from daycare. So can you talk a bit about that, please? For sure. So I think for any expat who takes the conscious decision to live in a foreign country, if it's a woman, if it's something that you've thought about, I think pregnancy and giving birth is it's a topic you spend a lot of time dwelling on. And of course, the moment we decided to move here, it was already spoken about that we would grow the family and that she or he at the moment, I don't know, would be born here. Um, generally I'm not, I was already scared of pregnancy and birth wherever, even if I was in Argentina. So that was a very scary period for me, but also doing it in a foreign country where I don't speak the language and where traditions for the arrival of a newborn are very, yeah, I would say orthodox. So I spent a lot of time thinking about this period of my life. When it comes to logistics, I investigated so much. Even before I was pregnant, I had spotted a clinic where I would deliver a private place where people would speak English. And that, would, that part was sorted, but it was more the emotional part that I had to work on a lot. And I had planned for my parents to be here for some time of my pregnancy and for the arrival of Vera so I could have that emotional support also from my side of the family. And everything worked out very well. I was very, yeah, I was completely scared, to be honest. But I also saw it as a milestone and something that I had to do and overcome, like a fear I had to overcome. And truthfully, it was way better than I had ever ever imagined in my life. I think that's also a positive here, a positive thing of living here because fortunately we were able to afford this private clinic, which was completely empty. There was not another mother that we count. So the whole clinic and all the staff were working for us. They took care of Vera so much. They took care of me. Yova was able to be in the delivery room with us. So we both brought her to the world, which is something that is not really possible at the public hospital. And we were over taken care of, which is something that I don't think would have happened in Argentina, if I'm honest. Fair enough, we paid for the service, right? But it would not change a thing. And then another part that I was very concerned about was her other side of the family, how they would react to this news. I was, there are certain traditions that I'm still not comfortable with. So I was very afraid how they would react. And even this was extremely surprising. They, 
it's something that I constantly forget and I have to remind myself that they know I'm not from here and they respect me and my wishes so much. And I would take things for granted or, or I would assume that certain traditions will take place and they didn't. They completely respected whatever I and my husband wanted and they were extremely happy and excited and it's just the, the whole multicultural aspect of our lives. They, everything just blended in. It was perfect. I would not change a thing. Well, that was the pregnancy delivery part of it. Now it's all the upbringing in this country. Now, of course, the... Yeah, going to what we were talking about before, the language barrier, it is now taking a toll because... It, it concerns aspects that have to do with her and I cannot fully be part of that. And it's getting frustrating and it's something I really have to work on. I always postpone learning the language properly, but now it's also my daughter's language as well as Spanish. And I feel like I really have to make an extra effort to learn. She started daycare and wherever in the world you are, this is difficult the first week or the second week, but it was extra difficult because we're talking to the person who's going to be with her for so many hours in the day and I could not communicate. I could not tell her what she likes, what she doesn't like, what to expect, or I couldn't communicate. It was extremely frustrating as a mother. But it seems that the way you're, you're talking about it, that there's no way that you're too frustrated or worried it's just a case of the communication otherwise the facilities are okay definitely first of all it's downstairs <laughs> it's downstairs from our building so we're just walking taking her there if anything happens we're there within 30 minutes the facilities are great i wasn't sure what to expect when it came to the first few days i didn't know how the adaptation process would be it's my first child, so I thought I would spend some time with her getting familiarized, but it was really not like that. They just picked her up and took her with the other kids. So that was a bit shocking. But really, after the third, fourth day, I saw, she, I, I saw how happy she was to go there. When we would pick her up, she's extremely happy, like she had a great time. Later, we found one of the tetas, the... The nannies are the teachers. She speaks English. So I think with time, I, it made me relax and feel comfortable that she's going there. Going back to language for a second. Have you started with play dates yet? When Vera says, Mommy, I've met Thomas and I want him to come and, and, and play for him. Have you got to that stage yet? Not really. <laughs> because where we live, there's this really nice, area like open air area so all the kids meet there and all the parents so now that the weather is fantastic we're always hanging out there with the kids and with the parents so it hasn't come down to really personal play this yet but i know it's gonna come very soon do you still do remote working or i'm giving it away now that you were remote working before in the teaching English as a foreign language industry, you certainly had to give that up. I would assume that you gave that up well in the latter stages of your pregnancy in the early stages of Vera's life. But do you have time to go back to that? Is it an easy thing to do now in BIH in Bosnia-Herzegovina to work remotely? Yeah, definitely. I did take a break when I was pregnant, but as soon as she turned three or four months, I went back uh, part-time. And then after that, I'm still in the TEFL industry, but not with that same job. But I am fully working remote, which is also why we decided to put her in daycare. We both work from home, my husband and I. Veda was here with us until a year and a half. And that was also one of the reasons why I wanted to work online, to be with her. But it came to a time where she's, completely bored out of us. She cannot be entertained and she wants to be with kids. So luckily we have the daycare very close by and she can go there for a couple of hours and we have more time to work and, and to focus in, in our projects. So 
working remote, I think, would be the number one option for any expat living in Bosnia. As we get to the end of this, you did mention something that I followed you, as I say, and I thought that the idea of exchanging just for a short amount of time the, how would we say, the misty and damp months of the year and then into the snowy months, which you said, I'm not really keen on this. I could handle the damp because I'm a Brit. Not okay. that I like it, not that I like it though. I find the snow here beautiful. When you look outside, it's picture perfect. But at my age, digging and digging in the winter is not my aim of fun. You've, as you said, found this way of going back to get some of your own Spanish culture back. And you said, it seemed to me that this is going to be an annual thing, a bit like the snowbirds in Canada that leave Canada to go down to Florida for a few months. You're going to be like whatever the local equivalent of a snowbird is. Are you going to be one of those? Yes. Yes. And that was in the that was in the imaginary contract that my husband and I signed when we decided to move here. I was very keen to move here. Just get me out during the winter months. I'm not I, I don't even think it's even the winter, the cold and the snow. It's the lack of sunshine. This is with imagine after ten years in Dubai, I never had a, a winter. For 10 years, every time I would have a fly to Europe, when it was winter, I would change it for a tropical destination. I do not do winters. And I didn't really have a choice to avoid the four seasons here. So that was one of the conditions for us to move here. And obviously, because in Argentina, when it's winter here, it's summer there. Now, Argentina is really far. And there are really warm places in Europe during the winters yeah that that that's the thing which is go away for not only for the mainly mainly for the weather but i think it's also nice to have a break from the routine and when you are an expat and you're not even for my husband actually i think it's for anyone it's a very routine like life here so it's really great to break away see something different listen to another language preferably the one i understand consume different food, everything that traveling is about. Go recharge. We appreciate, like once we are away, we do appreciate how nice life is here. We have a break and we come back ready to start. Finally, because I'm going to let you go now, you speak about Bosnia and Herzegovina and the experiences that you have, not only in the country, but in the wider region as well, so passionately and with a lot of positivity. Is there a word? I'm going to make it up if there isn't. Positivity. I was involved in a discussion ooh, two months ago about what am I an expat or am I an immigrant? And the discussion went on for some time, but at the end of it came out that if you were someone that was only going to spend a finite amount of time in a country, then you could be classed as an expat. But if you went in there for the, the full nine yards, so to speak, you would become an immigrant. And then if you took it to its logical conclusion, you would become a citizen. My plan is that I will be a long-term immigrant. What is yours? I would have to dive into the, the meaning of each word, but I think an immigrant, it's when you don't have a choice. I would have to check. I don't know if it's by, I don't know if an expat is when you decide to live there. An immigrant, I would have to check. I, and that question I cannot answer precisely <laughs> because who knows? I love it here right now. I love that my daughter can play outdoors without any issues right now. And I think given the past few years with the world's reality, it's very hard to make long-term plans or to think where we're going to be. Also, the fact that, you know, we are a mixed family. So there's always an option to go to Argentina, which we will for three months this year, because I feel like it's the right thing to see what it's like to be there for a bit longer than, than usual. And also because I want Veda to experience some time there. 
So let's see if I'm going to be an immigrant or an expat in the long term. And what you said earlier about me sharing so happily my experience here, it's something that I want to tell people and I always do. I, As far as I can remember, I know when was the first time that I heard of Yugoslavia and then later individually the countries. And when I was a kid, I could only hear negative things on the news unless you speak to my grandparents and they were telling me about Yugoslavia okay different story but I remember in the 90s I don't have a good positive memory about it but later when I went to Dubai and I started to meet all my Balkan friends and I could see that we were so much alike and the same age and then we would exchange life stories and to understand that when I was happily playing back home something else was happening here it was just incredible and I started to become really intrigued about the culture how come we went through different realities and we're still so much alike so later I started to take holidays I would go back home with them they would take me to their family's houses and I would experience this culture and I just really fell in love with it and Maybe that's why I ended up with one, not a friend, but one of the Balkans. Even as time passed by, and I would always bring up my Balkan friendships and with people who didn't know much about this part of the world and their con misconceptions of it. And it would really deep down upset me because, like I mentioned earlier, I don't like when people speak out of air without anything to back it up. Like, how can you tell me a person from here is a certain way when you probably haven't even met one of them? So I did take it as a responsibility to use social media that nowadays sometimes is not really properly used. I took it as a responsibility to show my story, my side of what it's like to live here, to show the real life and enough of showing what the news want you to see or what you've heard and... It's incredible to me, we go to Spain and they say they can hear me and my husband speaking in so many languages and then we're speaking to Veda in Spanish and in Serbian and the pe people are like, what's going on here? Like, where are you from? Blah, blah, blah. So then we say, oh, my husband's Serbian from Bosnia. Wow, it's really crazy what's happening in Kosovo, right? Are you guys okay? And this sort of comment just does something in my head that how it's Europe, man, please. I understand we don't know everything about geography, but it's really here. How can you not understand the geography, the context, or the nowadays news? And I started to answer in a very sarcastic way. We're not here. We're here on holidays. We're not refugees. We're here because we're on holidays and everything is okay in Bosnia. So you have to either start educating in some way or making them click. Oh, wow, what a really ignorant comment or question. And that's because it's me and I'm Argentinian and perhaps I can say it, but imagine if my husband speaks like that. He doesn't, he just, he's, I'm used to it. People don't know the difference between Slovenia and Slovakia in the same Europe. This for me is incredible. Your brand says it all. Balcatino. There we go. Was that you or was that your one? Or was it the two of it, you in harmony? Oh my God, Dave. This is crazy because we came up with this name in Dubai during the pandemic when we were locked in and we thought we have to start documenting all of this. It's incredible what's happening in the world. It's incredible how UAE and Emirates is handling it. Like we have so many stories to tell. Let's just start sharing. And we thought, what's going to be the name? Because if I narrow it down to Argentina, it doesn't really cover Latin America. And it's the same. If he chooses what he chooses, it's not the Balkans. So let's just do like to include all the groups. And that's when Malcatinos came up. So it was both of us. If somebody goes to their browser of choice now and types in balka not see i got this wrong initially i said balkantinos and you went no it's balkantinos so if you go to balkantinos what are they likely to find when they hit your content so we are sharing mainly our life here so the everyday life but also a lot of the mix between our cultures so my reactions 
to his culture and vice versa. A lot of food, a lot of mixing of food. For example, the other day, I was cooking my favorite dish, milanesas. And instead of using breadcrumbs, I used plasma, which is, <laughs> yes. Which is, Literally, I don't believe you said that. Because it's not, it wasn't labeled. And I'm like, <laughs> so it's like plasma is this biscuit, but you have the shredded version, like the crump version you can use for pancakes. Like, why would it be? Uh, when my mom was, was here, she arranged the kitchen and she mixed everything. So I finished making my milanesa. When I tried it, it was so sweet. And instead of, so this sort of thing, that could only happen in a Balcatina house. Denise, thank you so much for your time. And we must catch up in real life again soon yes with many beers yeah if i could still handle it lots of love to the family and a big hug to vera and we'll catch you soon and thank you once again for your time because i know you've got to race off now to daycare no thanks thank you for giving me the space and the time to share this and hi to everyone and i hope you guys come visit very soon